If you took Tesla out of it, took Solar City out of it, took SpaceX out of it, and you said, I could go start a new company tomorrow, it would be what? It would be in what area? Where would you start thinking about it? Well, I think, I think there's some uh, fairly, the, like, there's a fairly obvious opportunity in electric aircraft. Because um, all transport will electrify over time with the exception of rockets, um, ironically. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, but, but um, I, I, th th there's, I mean, th there's, I think there's, there's two areas which, I mean, they're fraught with issues, but, uh, you know, it's one of those things where if you, if you don't do something, maybe not doing something is worse, like on the AI front or um, on uh, genetics, you know. So, the, like, the, like the, 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 those are the two things, I think, besides sustainable transport, the Internet, um, and making life multiplanetary, uh, rewriting genetics uh, and uh, AI, uh, the, the latter two are, are the ones that will, can most change uh, destiny of humanity, um, but but they're they're really dodgy. So I mean maybe I'd try to do something in one of those two areas, but they're yeah fraught with difficulty. Uh, Elizabeth Holmes was here earlier, spoke during uh, the lunch hour. Do you think about genetics and longevity and trying to sort of no. avoid? You know, your friend Larry Page is investing in a business hoping to end death. I don't, I mean, the, the, I mean, I'm not actually a huge proponent of longevity. I mean, I do think that um, having a good life for longer is better. Like, you'd, you'd want to uh, address uh, the, you know, the things that, that happen to you when, when you're older, um, like dementia and so forth. Th those are pretty important. Um, but... Um, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure I sort of actually you know, want to do that, I want to get into the genetics thing, but it is something that's going to fundamentally change uh, humanity and um, uh, al along with AI. So You don't want to live forever so that you can actually no, get to Mars? I definitely don't want to live forever. How, how many years do you want to live? Um, I don't know, a hundred good ones. A hundred good ones or a hundred more good ones? You're 44? Um, I mean, 100 good ones in total, I think, is probably fine. I mean, maybe a bit longer. Um. <laughs> Sam, where, where, where would you put your money? You're, you're the investor here. Well, I mean, we, we try to invest in a very broad range of technology, so um, and we funded an electric airplane, or we funded an electric airplane company. Um, we've done AI companies. We've done... Uh, How realistic is the electric airplane, by the way? I think it should work. Yeah, I think it like it makes it it makes sense. Yeah, the, the, absolutely. The math should work. Um, I think I, I actually I, I no huge surprise, but I'll, I'll agree with Elon on those two areas. I think if you could pick uh, two things, and I'm not already working really hard on um, uh, AI, having AI go in the positive direction, which I really think it can, and I, I think thinking about sort of genetic technology. Genetic technology. Um, I, I made it unfair for you because I, I said we had to take Solar City out and we had to take the cars out, so we didn't get to really talk about energy. But I imagine how big, how big, how big a thing do you think energy all in? And when you think about both the, your investments and what you're doing, is something yeah. that is one of the things that you need to tackle. Well, I think sustainable energy is the most important problem that we face this century. Um, that's like a known difficult thing that we have to solve. Um, like if, if, we, if we continue to rely on burning hydrocarbons, it, the, the future is going to be quite bad, and the vast majority of the scientific establishment believes that. And the evidence, I think, is, well, I mean, for, for anyone with a scientific uh, background is um, you know, unequivocal. So, um, so, so we've got to solve sustainable energy. Uh, I'm a big fan of solar because we've got this big uh, fusion ball in the sky uh, called the sun, and uh, it shows up every day. So, if, if we can, you know, use solar energy plus batteries, we can actually have a complete solution for sustainable energy gener generation. And then we need to use it in a sustainable way, which is uh, 
you know, where, you, where you need the electric transport. Um, yeah, so. the, the thing I would add, I, I think um, getting the cost of sustainable energy down super low is probably, uh, you know, short of friendly AI, like the most important thing we can do for sort of quality of life of the poorest half of the world. I think that, uh, you know, every time I, I look into this, it, it's, it's really amazing how much the cost of energy and the quality of life correlate. What about nuclear energy? You have, you have some investments in nuclear energy. Yeah, I mean, what I've always said is I think the end state of the world is a combination of nuclear and solar, um, probably 80-20 one way or the other, sort of terrestrial-based nuclear. I, I think fusion is likely to work at some point in the next couple of decades, and, and that's a really big deal. Like what about that. the risks of, of nuclear energy? Of, of fusion? Of fusion. I assume there's some risk. There's no risk? Not really. Zero? I'm an idiot? I don't... Uh, no. Um, no, no I mean, with fusion, the difficulty is keeping it going. Uh, not... Uh, you know, with, with, with fission, uh, you, you have some meltdown risk, although there's, you know, there's new technology on the fission front that makes the meltdown risk extremely low. Um, but, um, but with fusion, the great difficulty is, just, is keeping the reaction from, is keeping it, the fire from going out. It, it's quite hard to sustain a fusion reaction, uh, unless you have something very big like the sun. And where, where you have, the sun has gravitational confinement of the fusion reaction. Um, so since you, you can't do gravitational confinement on Earth, you have to do some sort of uh, electromagnetic confinement in one form or another, uh, or, a, or a kinetic confinement by slamming things into each other. Um, so it's, it's quite tricky to prevent a fusion explosion from not immediately extinguishing. Okay, I didn't do so well in science, so we're going to try to uh, move along. Why would you ever want to live on Mars? Um, it's, yeah, it looks like a great adventure to me. No, really, I want to... Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the, the Mars thing is, is really, like, if you say what is going to be really important to the preservation of, uh, of, of civilization or life as we know it, more than just, you know, humanity, uh, because, of course, we bring life as we know it to Mars. Um, and that there's no life that we can detect on the surface of Mars. There may be some subterranean bacterial life, but there's no, it's, uh, on, on the surface, there, there isn't anything. Um, so this would be the extension of life to another planet. Um, or life as we know it to another planet, um, and um, I think would be make a huge difference to the probable a lifespan of human civilization and um, and life as we know it. So it's sort of like an insurance policy, a life insurance policy of life collectively, and um, you know. So it's yeah, probable. Because you th because you think global warming. What do you what do you think is going to no, happen no, it's, here? It's, that's going to. I don't want to be clear. It's, this is this is a. I mean, I, I think it's important that we become a multi-planet species, not a single planet species, but on another planet. Um, so this is if if we. It's like really, it's like what kind of future do you want to have? Do you want to have a future where we are forever confined to one planet, or one where we are out there exploring the stars and and on on many planets? And I think. The, the latter one is far more exciting and inspiring because the former is basically waiting around until some, some extinction event. So, because eventually there will be one. Um, and um, it might be quite far in the future, but it also might not be far in the future. Um, so there's, so there's, the, there's really two main reasons, I think, to make life multiplanetary and to establish a self-sustaining civilization on Mars. One is the defensive reason to, to ensure that the light of consciousness as we know it is not extinguished. Uh, or, or last much longer. And the second is that it would be an, uh, an amazing adventure that, uh, that we, we could all enjoy uh, vicariously, uh, if not uh, personally. Um, I want to talk about something else that's compelling, which is Tesla. It's we really nice. Talk about yeah, the X. Uh, um, it's an SUV. Um, it's an SUV, but here's what I was going to say. $132,000. How many people are really going to buy this thing? Um, yeah, so the... the <laughs> The, the, the first cars that are produced are fully, the sort of fully optioned version. So it's not like a base price of, uh, you know, 132,000. It's, um, and we'll have a, a version that's still expensive on the expensive side, but before it, any incentives would be about 75k next year, um, and um, you know, with incentives and whatnot, it's you know maybe 65. So it, it's it's still expensive, but it's not as crazy as 132. Right. Um, the, and, and then in, in a couple of years we should have the uh, Model 3, um, and that'll be starting price of um, $35,000. So it's, it's a smaller car, but it's, you know, um, 
a lot more affordable. Okay. <laughs> You've invested in Twitter. I'm, I'm in Twitter, in Tesla. Yeah. You own a Tesla. Yeah. Why? What, what is this going to become in your mind? You sure you don't have to answer? Yeah, yeah we know what um, he's going to say. Look, I mean, I think as most people who own one think, it's the best car like out there. Uh, I had a Roadster before a Tesla Roadster, which was not the best car. Um, <laughs> but the Model S, it really is. Like, it's, just, it's the best car on the market. And I think that uh, people think of this like existing car companies. Uh, but actually, this is like a software company with a car attached to it. And it's, you know, you just like, you sort of point and click. You like point the wheel somewhere, you push the thing down, and it just kind of gets there. It doesn't make noise. It, like, it's very reliable. The software actually works. It's the only car with good software. So I think people really like it. Now, yeah, it's like really expensive still. But uh, I think, uh, well, I'm confident that a mass market Tesla will do very well. And I also think the other electric cars I've driven feel like many years behind. Right. Uh, you talked about this being a software company. Do you think of yourself as a software company? I think we're, we're a software and a hardware company. Um, but, but the software component does become increasingly important. Um, so you've got to get both right. Um, because it's, it's, you know, it's a holistic product experience, but um, uh, it, it software is increasingly the, you know, an increasing proportion of the problem, particularly as you get to autonomy, um, and um, yeah. So. so there is a view, I don't know if it's a conspiracy theory, that you are building autonomous functionality and other driverless-like functionality into the car without advertising that it's in there, and that one day you're going to flip a switch and the car is going to start just driving? Um, well, uh, no, not quite like that. But the, 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 we are going to upload new software soon. And, and we, we've, this is not actually a secret or anything. Um, we, we have version 7 of our software, which turns on um, highway autopilot. So the car will be able to steer by itself on, on highways or, or any kind of um, any kind of road that doesn't have really steep, sharp curves on it. Um, and, um, and, and then also it'll steer quite well in, in traffic. So those are the two scenarios where it'll, it's going to be quite good at steering. Um, and and, and we'll, that, that's in public beta right now. So we have, um, I don't know, six or 700 uh, Tesla uh, drivers, owners that are um, testing the uh, auto steer software. And, but, and, yeah. the, go ahead. I think full self-driving cars, I'm not Tesla specifically, but just in general, are, are likely to get here much more quickly than people realize. Yeah, I think absolutely. if you ask most people, they'd still say that's 10 to 20 years away. Uh, and I actually think we'll have sort of like full point-to-point -point autonomous driving uh, in, a, in a few years. It won't be yeah. uncommon. A few years, like two or three years? Three or four, maybe. Yeah, Where you probably know that? better. I agree. I think that's something on the on the two, three-year time frame is likely for for it to be technologically. I mean, you'll be able to demonstrate it, um, but it won't. You won't be able to go to fully autonomous until you get regul regulatory yeah, approval. Yeah, that'll take longer. So there's there's a there's a time difference between when it is technologically possible, um, in a general sense, um, you know, so that you know, not not just like in a very tightly mapped situation, like say Mountain View or Palo Alto, right. but, but in the general sense of like you know, can it can it do point to point virtually anywhere? Right. Um, I think that's that's only you know two to three years away. Um, but but then approval of from regulators of of uh, having it be autonomous is anywhere from I don't know one to five years after that, depending upon the location, right. because. The regulators have, regulators have to be convinced that it is substantial. I, I think they'll they'll want to see that it's significantly more, uh, uh, signif significantly safer than than cars that are driven by people. I want to open it up in about five minutes, so I just have a couple more questions uh, to get to you. And so, if you guys have questions in the audience, uh, get your shot on goal in, in just a second. I want to talk about entrepreneurship because both of you are entrepreneurs. You invest in them. You are one, and you think about this a lot. Uh, your old pal Peter Thiel likes to say that he would not invest in somebody who's over the age of 30 years old. That that it should be the cutoff. <laughs> You're 44 now. He's invested in you. Yeah, I guess makes some exceptions. But you may be the, the exception to the rule. As, some, as somebody who invests in companies every day, do you think there's a cutoff? There's a lot of people over, out here who are over the age of 30. Are we done? Uh, 
I mean, we, we've said this before, but when we've looked at our data, uh, the, the mean age of the entrepreneurs we fund is just around 29 or 30. Um, so there's obviously lots of over 30 entrepreneurs that we fund, um, some of which have gone on to create multi-billion dollar companies. So I think certainly you can't say it's impossible for people over 30 to create companies. That's, that's ridiculous. Uh, and we plan to continue to invest in people of all ages. Um, the correlation that we've noticed is that uh, uh, if you look at the really successful companies we've had, the multi-billion dollar companies, the, the average, for those, average age for those founders does skew significantly younger, but the success rate of founders of you know, this binary is the company a success or not skews older than 30. So you know, younger entrepreneurs, I think, tend to take bigger risks. Uh, maybe they're willing to work on these very long time horizon projects, but that's the only correlation we see. I think it would be a crazy strategy to say, I'm never going to invest in anyone over 30. Yeah, no, I mean, I think, I think it's... I don't think Peter meant that either. Uh, yeah, I mean, you can definitely start a company at any age and be successful. I mean, it's really just a question of, like, do you, you know, do you have a good idea? Are you working really hard? Do you, are you able to attract a great team and motivate the team? Um, and that, uh, I mean, that, that's sort of really what, what matters. But you've had multiple ideas. And there's, a, there's another view, by the way, which is that you can only really have one great idea, right? That everybody is sort of has maybe, maybe one great no, idea. I, I, it's not really the idea. You know what I mean? Like there's a, that old saying, it's 1% inspiration I, I th and 99% perspiration, I think is generally true. I mean, a lot of times like, companies start out with, with, with uh, an idea that's actually wrong, um, but they, they adapt uh, quickly enough to get it to something that, that's right. right. Um, and I can say like at the beginning of Tesla, we started out with, uh, we, we started the company with two false premises, like that would turn out to be like really dumb. Um, uh, one was that uh, we'd be able to uh, license the drivetrain uh, technology from a company called AC Propulsion in Southern California, and that it would just work. That didn't. That totally didn't work. Um, and then we also thought we'd be able to adapt the Lotus Elise chassis at low cost, um, and be able to essentially put the AC Propulsion drivetrain technology in a Lotus Elise chassis and then just build that quickly and, uh, and sell it and that, it would, that that would be okay. Um, but, but like I said, the AC propulsion technology did not lend itself to uh, any, any kind of cost-effective, reliable right. car. Um, it was okay for like a small prototype, but not, not for a commercial product. And, and, the, uh, and then the Lotus Elise, um, that, that ended up being worse than if we had designed a car from, from the beginning um, because we ended up uh, changing like 96% of the components in the car um, and invalidating all of the crash results and all the safety stuff. The car ended up being 30% heavier, it had to be longer, um, and it, it ended up being like, like if, you, if, you want, if you had a house in mind and instead of actually building a house from scratch, you got some existing house and ended up knocking everything except one wall in the basement out. Um, and, uh, and it would have been better to just build the house from the beginning. Right. So, so, so it basically, Tesla was started on the basis of two dumb ideas. Um, and um, but we managed to, you know, it was a tough one to overcome those two, two issues, but we, we managed to get, get past them. That's, so that's, I think, the more important thing is, like, start somewhere and then, you know, really be prepared to question your assumptions uh, fix what you did wrong and uh, ad adapt to reality. How do you run two companies at the same time? What is the, what does a day in the life of Elon Musk actually look like? Yeah, I wouldn't recommend running two companies. Uh, this is, um, it really it decreases your freedom um, quite a lot. So my day is probably a bit different than people think it is. I mean, most of my time is actually spent on uh, engineering and design. So that's probably, I don't know, like 70% of my time. Um, like press stuff like this is maybe 2 or 3% of my time. It's really, really tiny. Um, and I'm going to reduce it even further. It's probably like 1% of my time. Uh, Elon Musk, Sam, Alt Sam Altman, thank you guys.